endeavor, Sustainable Canada Dialogue, is to put possible actions and solutions on the table to help Canada move forward. So extending uh, the dialogue, our second report, is fundamentally different for, from the first one. Um, because really it's the time to turn the mic to the population. Immediately after we launched, the day after, we reached out as broad as we could to Canadians and say, please now, read what we said and build from that. Tell us what works, tell us what doesn't work, improve, add, subtract. And from that, we hope that we can have the emergence of a vision for this country. Today, I want you to think about dialogue, of course. I want you to think about action, and I want you to think about solutions. Um, this is a very po important point uh, in time, both for Canada, but actually for the world. We have COP21 coming up in Paris, and we actually already have a draft text. Canada is in a crisis. Climate change is the most significant threat to not just Canadians, but the world. But that being said, the path forward actually looks very bright. You've got this shield that First Nations hold with, with our Aboriginal and treaty rights and our, and our time and dedication on this territory. Um, but we also have a very powerful sword, and that's Canadians. We have strong allies in environmental groups and unions and scientists and academics and community members because you have the numbers, the power, the wealth, the education, the influence, and you can vote your governments in and out of power. So if you put those two things together, there literally isn't anything we can't do to turn this around. And we can turn it around. Science says we can. Traditional indigenous knowledge says we can fix this. So I think going forward, um, decolonizing this path and, and recognizing the important decision-making role that First Nations have will actually be the power, the source of power behind any action that we take on climate change. And I think if, if we can get all of our partners and Canadians to embrace that, um, it's a done deal. We're good. We've saved not just Canada, but the planet. Uh, in our work, uh, we regularly uh, confront this enormous uh, deliberate myth that there's a fundamental conflict or trade-off between environmental protection and economic security. You can have a livable planet or you can have a job, but you can't have both. And our chapter in this book is dedicated to uh, uh, trying to fundamentally dispose of that myth. Uh, if that frame is allowed to shape the discourse that we have, then we're going to lose. We're going to lose on both counts because we're obviously going to lose on the environmental issue, but we're going to lose on the jobs as well. Because I don't know if anyone has noticed, but the uh, status quo approach to managing our economy and managing our environment isn't exactly panning out. I believe if we protect our environment by doing more work rather than by doing less, then uh, we have got an enormous economic opportunity ahead of us uh, through uh, the jobs and incomes and tax revenues that would be generated by appropriate investments in public transit, energy efficiency, producing fuel efficient vehicles, uh, sustainable energy uh, sources, um, uh, caring services uh, which are environmentally benign or in some cases environmentally beneficial, and, and even the task of taking the resources which we harvest, and we are always going to harvest resources, but uh, harvesting them in a more sustainable manner and more, uh, uh, more mindfully and proactively adding value to those resources and capturing the value added and incomes and opportunities that come with that, rather than digging it out of the ground and sending it to someone else who's going to do all that work uh, for us. The public appetite for spending money on carbon reductions is not infinite. So minimizing the cost per ton is essential. The law of diminishing returns means the closer we get to a 100% low carbon power system, the more expensive each incremental step becomes. With each billion dollars spent on achieving the ideologically pure idea of 100% low carbon electricity, we get less and less carbon reduction per dollar spent. These funds could be far more effectively spent on more cost-effective carbon reduction efforts, including public transit, building envelope issues, et cetera. Um, drastic reductions in emissions are essential, but f 
formally adopting the policy goal of 100% low carbon power by 2035 would be counterproductive and would lead, in our view, to unintended and negative consequences. It seems clear that we're heading towards an important national debate on the role of large hydro in Canada's energy future. Difficult choices lie ahead. I wanted to talk about the way we frame issues. We're framing the problem in too small a way. Uh, there was a U.S. president uh, in the 50s, Dwight Eisenhower. There's a principle named after him, the Eisenhower principle, because he once said when describing his strategy at Normandy that I found that if I made the problem bigger, I found solutions that I didn't see when I was looking at it in a smaller context. We have, to, we have to redefine the language even that we tackle this problem with. We don't have to reduce emissions, we have to stop them from occurring. And a lot of the cities that I'm working with now are starting to change the question that they're asking from, how can we reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of our future city, to how can we build a low carbon sustainable city? Sounds like the same question at first, but it's not. It, change, it takes you from the remedial to the anticipatory, from the despairing to the hopeful, and from the smaller to the larger set of solutions. And that's why I would encourage all of you, especially the students and the younger people in the room, to go as you tackle this problem, which will continue to be in front of us, unfortunately, for decades into the future. is how do we move beyond the debate and move into actually doing something? Just the change in the urban form, which is primarily around issues of uh, how we move in cities, how we build our cities, how we integrate neighborhoods so they're not single purpose silos, how we uh, look at issues of housing affordability, how we look at uh, the preservation of nature in city cities. If we did all that, and there, and there are current practices that we would love to do, we would have solved a big chunk of the goal that we have, and the goal, of course, at least in the report, was could we achieve that generally accepted standard of 80% uh, below 1990 levels by 2050? And I want to just make sure that we recognize this is not a technical problem. The barriers to the work that we want to do are all human barriers. So I just want to emphasize as we go into the next part of the conversation here that we also have to make sure that this is recognized as not a climate challenge, this is a human challenge. The voice of youth supports the scientists in their efforts to shake our leaders. We appeal to all young people to get informed and to remain alert to all the opportunities that arise around them to make their voices heard whether participating in a local, national, or international event, targeting climate change as a subject in school work, or being involved in a local committee, we recognize the importance of these opportunities, but also of the courage to create them ourselves. The, the effects are visible, the damage is extensive, and it is time for action. Eat and I will feed you till the summer blows away. All that I need is some dirt and a seed. And I will feed you till the summer blows.